All right, as soon as you make me the host, I'll get us going. All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome Kelsey to give us this talk about rhetorical analysis. Kelsey, I'm just looking for, where are you, Kelsey Forkner? Uh, there's a lot of participants on here. There you are. Oh, you're at the top. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, I'm making Kelsey the host. Hey, I see some familiar faces out in the crowd. Nice to see you guys. And I'm just going to turn on subtitles here real quick in the interest of accessibility. Um, let me know if you have any difficulty seeing or hearing because I can adjust things. Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about rhetorical devices. Um, my name is Kelsey Forkner and I'm an MFA student here in photography at Texas Tech. I have a previous master's in English from Illinois State University, and I've been working at various writing centers since 2010. I love to help people with their writing and help figure out ways to make the process less unpleasant. So, um, rhetorical devices are techniques that writers and creators are using to persuade or to communicate. So when we analyze them, we're asking ourselves some basic questions about what techniques the author is using, where they're being used within a paper or a video or a podcast, um, how they're being used, why the author is using them, like what the author's purpose is. Um, and then we're asking whether they were effective for the author's audience and how we know that to be the case. Because sometimes there's things that will be effective for, for example, reaching my husband to persuade him of something and reaching my 10 month old son to persuade him of something are going to be vastly different. So audience is hugely important when we consider these things. I was seeing things in the chat. Okay, uh, making sure nobody had a question for me there. Um, so we're going to use some assistance um, from a little known artist called Taylor Swift um, for this PowerPoint and she has been putting out songs since 2006, which was shockingly almost 14 years ago. She's used almost every rhetorical device there is, um, so we're going to borrow from some of her songs today. We can think of Kairos as timeliness or of an opportune moment. Um, it's a product of both history and opportunity, though. It gets at questions of when they're using things. Um, it also gets at questions of why. Fortunately, Taylor Swift has us covered on this one, and I'm going to need a Taylor Swift expert, someone who's heard a couple of her songs for this question. Um, why is she saying it feels like one of those nights we won't be sleeping? You can answer in the chat. You can um, unmute yourself. <laughs> Sava hasn't got that one. Anyone else? Why is she saying it feels like one of those nights we won't be sleeping? Yeah, you can turn on your camera if you'd like to, Adonis. <laughs> yeah, she's hinting at something for sure. Um, so this is from a song called 22. So she's talking about feeling 22. So for her, feeling 22 is, and I'm quoting from the song, about feeling happy, free, confused, and lonely in the best way. So it's a product of history, of knowing what it feels like to be 22, and of timeliness of the right feelings that are recapturing an earlier experience. So as a writer, she goes on to describe more things that make her feel 22. It's a long time ago. Um, so for example, if a lot of people are asking you if you've registered to vote yet, out of nowhere, like why might they be asking if you're registered to vote yet right now? Something coming up hypothetically Oh, are there elections, really? <laughs> yes, so we know that elections are coming. Yes, fantastic. Um, so that's Kairos. 
that's a timely thing that's happening right now. So it's, it's relevant historically. We know this is something that occurs at approximately this time, um, but it's also happening very, very soon. So we could ask you if you're registered to vote six months ago, but asking now is more relevant. It's more timely. It gets at Kairos more strongly. So when we analyze it, we're looking at those questions. Why is the author using it? When are they using it? What are their reasons for using it? Um, and is it effective for their audience? So for example, I assumed we would have at least one person who was really into Taylor Swift out there, and we did not. <laughs> so mine failed in this case, it was ineffective for my audience. Um, so that's my bad guys. <laughs> but it still gets at a good learning opportunity for understanding audience and these rhetorical devices. Um, Kairos matters a lot because of things like journals and magazines and newspapers. They want to publish things that are relevant and interesting, and Kairos gets at that. We're going to take a look at rhetorical distance next. So rhetorical distance um, is a technique it helps us to get at who our author is and what his or her purpose is in writing. If we think of rhetoric as communication, which is all that it is, and distance about being about how close or how far away something is, then it's pretty easy to understand that rhetorical distance is about how the writer or creator presents him or herself as close to or far away from the audience. One way that authors do this is through person. In first person, um, if you can see my little cursor here on the screen, we use I. We're talking about ourselves. It's about as intimate and informal as a writer can get because it's personal, it's close, it's small. So I used my little greater than, less than symbol here to show it's got that intimacy when we're using that I. Um, if I talk about myself and I share personal things like telling you I have a baby or two cats or about my husband, I'm being vulnerable. This can create trust, but it can also seem really inappropriate depending on the context. If we're at a restaurant, for example, do you remember restaurants? A couple of people seem to remember restaurants. Uh, and the waiter, a total stranger, sits down and um, comes and wraps their arms around you and starts talking about how much they love their grandma. You might be really glad that your waiter loves his grandma, but you might also want him to stop touching you because you've never met before and to take your order because you are in a place that sells food with the intention of buying food. Um, so context always matters. Next closest is we. That's when we talk about, as writers, ourselves and the audience. It's participatory. It makes it seem like we're all working together. Uh, then we have you, which is second person. It goes even further and talks directly to and about the audience. But there's a problem there, and Taylor Swift is getting at that problem for us. She says, um, someday I'll be big enough that you can't hurt me, so she is talking about you here and about how all you're ever going to be is mean. Um, and she is speaking informally. We know that from her word choice, for one thing. She says gonna. Uh, and that's a great example of keeping it informal, keeping it closer to that intimacy. In the context of the song, she's clearly talking about a man. But if we read just this sentence, that you is the listener. And if Taylor Swift tells me that all I'm ever going to be is mean, that's pretty insulting. That hurts my feelings, Taylor. I would never do those things. Um, and I certainly hope that all of us can be something more than mean. So second person is intimate and includes the audience, but unless you know that audience really well, you have to be careful to avoid making false assumptions about them. It's one reason why if you bring a formal paper into the writing center, we'll often encourage you to stay with third person, which is our last option. And you can see it's about as far away from I as we can get. That's when we use they and it. We keep the focus on ideas. We say things like the research shows or the author indicates. Um, and with these, we come across as distant and scientific and unbiased, even if we aren't. Um, we tend to use more formal language, uh, we tend to use more formal structures that have a lot of rules that go with them and do things like cite our sources. And those all get at rhetorical distance at how we present ourselves. Are we formal? Are we distant? Are we unbiased? Are we close? Are we personal? Are we intimate? And we can communicate those things through language. So it's a really versatile tool to understand what an author is doing. 
These next three slides are all about stories we tell ourselves about how the world works. Some of them are ideas that are shared by an entire country, others by smaller cultural groups, and others might just be held by a single person um, who others may or may not agree with. So mythos is a concept shared by an entire people group. These are huge overarching ideas. They aren't even generally seen as controversial, even though different views might be held about them in other parts of the world. So I'm gonna ask some very obvious questions. Please humor me and play along. What's a nightmare? And again, feel free to unmute or to um, respond in the chat. Bad dream. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So we've got a, a bad or a scary dream. What's a daydream? A dream in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so something we have while we're awake. Absolutely. Is it usually bad, usually good? Yeah, <laughs> you're sounding out during the day. Something good? Yeah, generally. Okay, so we're all coming up with similar answers because in this particular large overarching cultural group, um, we have these shared concepts of what a nightmare is and what a daydream is. So we know that a nightmare dressed as a daydream is something bad dressed up as something good. So we know what she's doing. Um, but is there a reason for using these commonly understood concepts instead of saying, I'm something bad dressed up as something good? And that basically comes down to, she's using our understanding of these big concepts to communicate something clearly and quickly in a more interesting way. It lets us fill in this thought with memories of our own daydreams and our own nightmares. Colors are another great example of mythos. If we write something in red pen on someone's paper, what does it mean? Bad. Needs revising, something went wrong, yeah. So again, these are concepts all of us understand. That's mythos. Mm -hmm. We're making corrections, we're making these marks. Um, so that's something that we're understanding in context because we're seeing it on a paper. We're understanding it through the color. We're understanding it through what's written with that particular color. Um, if a professor writes something in green and it tells us to, you know, that we've got to run on sentence there, well, we're still going to understand it's bad, but it's not going to be as fast as mythos lets us communicate things. Um, so this concept, again, is just a good way to understand how authors are approaching things, what they're trying to communicate and why, and who they think their audience is. All right, cultural logics. Um, cultural logics are the beliefs or systems that are held by slightly smaller groups. Um, so we can look at things like countries as a good example of mythos. If we get smaller, we could get it like people in this group right now, um, people at Texas Tech in general, for our example of cultural logics. These are cultures, they're smaller groups. So she's saying when you're 15 and somebody tells you they love you, you're gonna believe them. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let's see if we can use the reactions buttons on here. Let's say, give me a, a clap if you agree. And maybe, I don't know, the one that looks like confetti, if you disagree. Awesome. Yeah, so we've got some agreement here. We've got some disagreement here. Um, there isn't a right or a wrong answer for this one because it's it's going to be based on um, individual people, but for portions of a given group, this is going to register as true. And the reason she put this in her song is because, you know, we can make guesses. Um, what audience do you think she's successfully communicating with? Who does this resonate for? Who does this resonate for? Um, what type of person? <laughs> Girls around the age of 15. <laughs> Teenagers, yeah. Uh-huh. So we're talking about young people, potentially other women, um, maybe people who are very trusting, people who are dreamers, people who are loving and want to be loved. Um, and she could be using this for all sorts of purposes, but it's easy to guess that she, you know, wants the song to be successful, that it, she wants it to resonate with people who are similar to her. 
uh, that young people are trusting and that sometimes people betray that trust maybe to show the intensity that comes with youth and first love. So there are a ton of different reasons why she might be using this. Uh, so if we go ahead and click on to our next one, we're getting even smaller. We're just gonna keep on narrowing down. So ideology is point of view. Um, and it can be just summed up as a person's worldview. It's their perspective. They're closely held beliefs about how we see the world. Um, some beliefs are very common. So technically all of those things that fell under mythos and cultural logic, they're part of ideology too. Um, but they vary more from person to person. So ideologies are rarely spelled out. Some people may not even be able to identify why they believe or feel a certain way. So these are things we pick up as children. We pick them up from our culture, from our families, from our friends, and they become often unexamined parts of our identities. And sometimes we even just refer to them as common sense. Um, for example, in a crowded hallway, most people move to the right side. Why is that? Same as driving. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh huh. And it came from horseback riding? Yeah. Uh, it makes things more orderly. Most people tend to be right handed as well. So, for some people, um, like the many who chimed in on our chat here very helpfully, <laughs> yes, unless you're from England, um, that's just part of their ideology, this understanding. It's also a part of their cultural logic. But I had never noticed this, and I'm, I'm a chaos person, so I would just walk wherever I felt like or um, wherever it was less crowded, and he would be like, what are you doing when we first started dating? Like, we don't walk on that side of the hallway. Um, so that came down to ideology, and when we consider and recognize that other people have different ideology than we do and through the way they act and write, and speak are communicating that ideology. It's very useful. So Taylor Swift here says, you took me by the hand and you picked me up at six. Today was a fairy tale. Um, Love her hater, she does fall on fairy tale imagery a lot. Um, so what do you think of when you hear the phrase fairy tale? Fantasy, yeah. A daydream come true. <laughs> living happily ever after yes yeah, so we have a lot of really positive connotations that come with that things like yep knights princesses and dragons good good identifications there too thank you um so disney movies and princesses and happy endings and daydreams and all of these super positive things um but this this is really common as a way to perceive what a fairy tale is. But those are also pretty new viewpoints. The origins of what we know as fairy tales come from folk tales written down and modified by Charles Perrault and Hans Christian Andersen and the Grimm brothers. And many of their fairy tale endings are not things you likely want to redo a child. They involve pain and torture and murders and in a few cases rape, they're pretty graphic. Um, in Hans Christian Andersen's version, Hans, I don't know why I stopped being able to pronounce things correctly there. Uh, version of The Little Mermaid, for example. Part of the price for having human legs is that every step the princess takes feels like she's stepping on sharp knives. At the end of the story, he falls in love with someone else, and The Little Mermaid nearly kills him so she can steal his soul and become human. Uh, so it has a much darker ending in that way. So ideology comes about where a person is standing and what they've, you know, picked up culturally and from their families. Yeah, absolutely, John Ross. Um, it can be a way to insult people and, and call them delusional. They're living in a fantastical world. Um, so there are all these ways that we can use fairy tale. Um, and a lot just depends on where your understanding of that is coming from. Absolutely, we're always coming back to context with these things. So we're gonna have a little challenge here. So this quote came up from a recent 
Texas Tech press release. It's talking about an event that's going to be held to make a big announcement about the School of Veterinary Medicine. So we're going to use those rhetorical, rhetorical terms we just used. And if you need me to flip back to a slide, I definitely can. Um, and I'm going to read this aloud and just take a second. So Texas Tech University System Chancellor Ted L. Mitchell, Texas Tech University President Lawrence Skovanek, Texas Tech School of Veterinary Medicine Dean Guy Lonergan, I'm going to guess, um, and Amarillo Mayor Ginger Nelson will announce achieving a significant milestone for the School of Veterinary Medicine, which is located adjacent to the TTU HSC at Amarillo campus. An initiative that was announced in December 2015, the School of Veterinary Medicine has received support from both communities, veterinarians, and so many others from across Texas, as well as the Texas legislature and administration. Ground was broken on the site of the school in September 2019 and construction is on schedule. The school will welcome its very first class of veterinary students in the fall of 2021. All right, so a little bit harder piece of writing we're getting into um, more of more academic language here. So let's take our first one. You've got Kairos. So why are they writing this right now? Again, feel free to unmute or to use the chat. Um, the school is opening in the fall of next year. So yeah. that's relatively new, relevant, recent. Absolutely. So we're dealing with an opportune moment. Um, we're also dealing with history. So we know that ground was broken fairly recently. So, um, and we've got that big opening coming up and it seems like they're about to announce achieving a significant milestone from that first paragraph. So a whole lot going on there. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a whole ton of reasons to talk about Kairos just in these two paragraphs alone. Uh, what about rhetorical distance? Yes, absolutely. That's another fantastic identification. It's not in this, but that context of um, our cultural understanding that applications are open for fall of 2021. I'm going to flip back to cultural logics for a second here. Understanding Texas Tech and knowing those things about the school lets you chime in. You have a great understanding of cultural logics. So that's a great reason for them to publicize that right now too. Yes, absolutely, and <laughs> start applying. Um, so yeah, for sure. So we've got cultural logics. Um, thank you very much, Lauren, for hitting that for us. And we've got Kairos already happening here. So how about rhetorical distance? Formal, informal, how do we know? I would say formal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a couple of votes for formal. Perfect. Um, so we're third person. It's talking about ideas. There's no I, there's no we, there's no you. It's all um, an initiative. Ground was broken. Who broke the ground, guys? We see what you're doing there. Um, you're keeping it very formal and they're, they're making it about the events and not about the person who's writing it. Um, we don't feel particularly close to the author. So those are all ways that we can analyze why the author is using distance and how they're using distance. Um, they're not using slang. You know, Taylor Swift way back on our rhetorical distance slide is using gonna um, instead of going to. We're not seeing that here in this press release and that's because they want to come across as formalist and professional. Um, what about ideology? Do we have any of that in here? TTU pride a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I think you could make a case for TTU pride, but we don't really know anything about the author. It seems like they're intentionally obscuring themselves. So when we choose to write about things and use rhetorical terms to analyze them, it's usually easier to write a paper about things where we have a lot to say and there's a lot of material to pull from. There's not a whole lot for ideology here. Maybe if they announce what the significant milestone is, we could know a little bit about what that particular person thinks constitutes a significant milestone. But otherwise, yeah, other than saying this person knows a lot about Texas Tech, we don't have too much about them. Now, I think that was a great contribution. Um, 
And so it's really helpful to understand these terms and how to use them even if every term isn't going to be the best fit for every rhetorical situation, every piece of writing or communication we analyze. Um, so I'd just like to thank you guys. I'm a big fan of yours. Um, I appreciate you all coming and I hope we'll see you at future workshops in the Writing Center and I'll just open it up to questions now. Um, I was wondering if you could go over cultural logics again. I, I uh, unfortunately kind of missed a little bit of it. Um, uh, could you give me, I guess, a, a concrete definition, if, if that's even possible? Yeah, that's definitely possible. So um, I'm going to flip back through these real quick. So mythos, right? An entire people group. Ideas about how they see the world. Cultural logics smaller people groups. So if we can think of mythos as an entire country, cultural logics might be something like people in Texas Tech, people in Texas, people in Missouri. Um, they can be smaller groups too, like they might be the people who attend a particular church. They might be, um, I don't know, everyone who's a member of a particular club. So cultural logics can be groups that are still more than one person, um, generally more than three people, but I, it doesn't come down super precisely to the numbers, um, but smaller than an entire people group and bigger than one or a couple of people, generally. Uh, it's right in the middle, but it all comes back to you for those, you know, what are the values held by this group? What do they believe to be true? Where do those ideas come from? Um, other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how important would you say, or well, what do you think the importance of understanding the rhetorical devices that uh, historical figures use in historical documents and how we analyze them? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. And there are a couple of different ways you could approach that. As someone who is going to write and want to persuade other people, it's really useful to know what devices they used and whether or not they were effective and how and why so that we can take those ideas and use them ourselves and use them effectively. It's useful for understanding how and why they impacted the cultures they were a part of. So from a historical standpoint, that can be interesting. So personally and historically valuable. Um, they can be helpful for helping us to construct our idea of those particular people, um, what they valued, um, how they chose to present themselves. So from a lot of different standpoints, that's useful. Um, if you wanna criticize the person <laughs> or their writing, they can be helpful from that perspective too, or point out how they're unsuccessful. Um, I think those are would be the the main ones that just spring immediately to mind for wanting to have these. Do you think that the historical um, or the rhetorical devices and uh, how we analyze things have changed since the original creation of their definition? <laughs> uh, yes, I would say in a lot of ways they have. At least the things the like mediums we're applying them to have changed fairly substantially. Um, you know, our, our good friends Aristotle and Plato are not analyzing podcasts and videos. Um, so the way that they conceived of these terms is going to be different than the way that we're applying them now. Like if you look at rhetorical distance in a personal blog that someone is uploading to YouTube, that's not a, a rhetorical context that a lot of those thinkers and scholars ever had an opportunity to explore. Although, frankly, I think a lot of them would have used it because they were, you know, publishing their opinions in pamphlets that they were often handwriting and then going and distributing personally or having their friends distribute, uh, which is really wanting other people to hear your opinion. And I think that means using the biggest platform you have available to you typically. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple others. Uh, one about how to structure the essay. I think the assignment gives you a fair amount of leeway if you're in um, the comp courses about how to structure that, but it's generally helpful to start by thinking about the devices that you would like to tackle um, and the order you'd like to tackle them in, because part of what you'll do is consider those devices, where they happen, how the author's using them and why. So these questions from the beginning 
Um, and if there's any, you know, page to screenshot, I, I would say it's this one, just in terms of usefulness. Because those questions you can use for pretty much every single rhetorical device that your instructors list as being available to you for these assignments. So once you've identified your devices that you want to use that apply best to your piece of writing, you can choose these and then think about the order you want to approach the devices in. So I might want to use Kairos first, for example, for that press release, because a lot of it is focused on when they're accepting applications, when they're making this new announcement, when the school is opening, when they broke ground. Uh, a lot of it is just focused on dates and timeliness. So that might be my central one, and then everything else I could connect to that timeliness as a way to support it. So lots of options there. They, they give you a fair amount of leeway. Um, any other questions? Um, can you give me any of the uh, possible benefits of uh, third person over first? Oh, yeah, there are a ton. <laughs> so third person comes across as the most formal. It puts the focus on your ideas. It makes you sound um, objective and scientific. Um, it makes you honestly come across as an academic more so than any of the other versions. So if you look at most academic papers, they're going to be written in third person. Anytime we start with I, we're also, you know, wasting a fair amount of sentence space. Um, so, you know, consider just like grammatically the difference between, I think rhetorical devices are very important and rhetorical devices are very important. It gets immediately down to those ideas that you're communicating. How could you define if a, yeah, I think you make a good point there. Um, Sava, it is also about not offending the audience. It's showing that you take your ideas and what you're talking about seriously. And it does come across as the most serious. Um, how can I define if a writing is rhetorical? Are there any keywords to define? Um, so these are all rhetorical devices that have, you know, particular definitions. Um, your instructor may have particular ways that they view them too, because the terms are a little bit adaptable. And there are a lot of people who, you know, consider rhetoric professionally and who have since, frankly, since Plato and even before um, people. So rhetoric, maybe I'll come back to your first question first here. How do I define if a writing is rhetorical? Rhetoric is communication. So all writing, all communication is in a certain sense rhetoric. Um, and as long as people have been communicating, they've wondered about how to communicate well, how to communicate more effectively. How do we tell a person that we love them and have them believe it? That's rhetorical communication. How do we show that we understand a concept deeply? That's rhetorical communication. Um, other questions? All right, um, I'll turn it back over to um, Dustin. Do you have any other announcements you want to make? Uh, no, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Kelsey. I think this was a fantastic workshop. Obviously, you know, people were very interested in discussing this. I think everyone contributed it a lot. And I just really appreciate everyone coming here and um, working with us on rhetorical analysis. Uh, if you have any questions or you'd like to talk to us about rhetorical analysis or anything else involving writing, please come in and see us at the Writing Center, okay? I say come in. Um, please make an appointment to have a tutorial session with us online at the Writing Center, right? Uh, come online. Um, <laughs> we would love to talk to you about rhetorical analysis or any other uh, issues that you want to discuss with writing. And um, we will be having more workshops 
next semester. Look on our website for those um, at the beginning of the spring semester. But just would like to thank Kelsey so much for doing such a fantastic job on this workshop. Yeah, thank you guys.